So for this evening's talk, uh, I'd like to uh, just to talk a little bit about um, uh, a little bit about happiness and the 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 role that that happiness plays in the path to nibbana. And I must admit, uh, just to start off with, that I'm a bit um, ambivalent about the whole idea of happiness myself. And I, 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 you know, I look at all the, the happiness has become such a, a buzzword these days. You have all the happiness conferences and, and uh, you know, magazines and there's all these happy people in them. And I always look at them and think, you're not really happy. <laughs> Nobody's that happy. And uh, <laughs> you ever felt like that? You kind of look at all these Buddhist magazines. I remember looking at one tricycle magazine a few years ago, and there's all these kind of American Buddhists, and they're all smiling gaily at the camera. And I'm thinking, come on, man. And, uh, <laughs> and there was one photo in the whole magazine. There was one photo of someone who wasn't smiling. Yeah. And uh, that, that photo was like an ad for a retreat center or meditation center. It was a photo of a Zen monk or Zen priest or something who looked like he was in or just coming out of some quite deep meditation. And he had this, this look on his face of like this, this deep uh, tranquility. Yeah, it was very, 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 it was quite, quite a stunning photo actually, very kind of profound tranquility, which doesn't look happy at all. Yeah? There's this depth of, of uh, tranquility. So that was the one that, that uh, I really liked. So anyway, happiness, uh, uh, despite the fact that I, I you know, personally have a bit of an aversion to happiness, but the, I, I have to sort of reluctantly and grumpily kind of admit that it is an important part of the Buddhist path and uh, something that should be developed, even though it goes against my natural inclinations. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, often that we're told in, in uh, Buddhism these days that uh, happiness is, um, uh, it seems to be changing a lot. But, but, but one, point, one viewpoint is that, that uh, you know, be, be scared of happiness, right? You're going to get attached to it. And that's certainly what I was told in my first retreat uh, that I did. So when, when I was meditating and after a couple of weeks of enduring uh, almost, almost, pretty much uninterrupted suffering for about two weeks. Um, and I'm starting to think, you know, there's supposed to be like these, these kind of three signs, you know, suffering. You're supposed to like impermanence. I'm wondering, come on, I've, I've, I've seen the suffering bit. Now I want some of the impermanence a bit, you know. <laughs> the suffering looks pretty permanent to me right now. And then after about two weeks or so, it did impermanent itself. And I actually got happy for a while. And I went into my meditation interview and I said, oh, oh, I feel really happy today. I had lots of joy in my meditation. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, that'll be impermanent. Yeah. <laughs> so that, was, that only lasted a couple of days. Unfortunately, the, the uh, happiness sometimes seems to be rather more impermanent than the suffering is, you know, <laughs> which is a bit of a problem, but I have to deal with that. Uh, Ajahn Daisaro commented on that sometime and uh, in his, his typical, typical Ajahn Jaisara way, he sort of commented that uh, the problem is if you, if you get, like if you, if you have something which you enjoy, let's say you enjoy drinking a glass of fruit juice, but the, you know, it very quickly, like it, it starts to become suffering. Like you just have to have like two or three glasses and already it, it, you're not enjoying it. And once you've had like four or five glasses, it's already, you know, it's pretty painful. And so it's very quickly it switches over from happiness to suffering, whereas painful things, Keep on just being painful, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they don't sort of go over to the happiness side of things. So this is one of the problems with life. Why? Sorry. And why is that? Why is that? I don't know. I just because life sucks, I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So happiness. So. Despite the fact that I do have, um, yeah, a bit of bit of a problem with it, I do have to admit that that the kind of the attention that we have in, in the last few years has really shifted in Buddhism towards emphasising happiness. is It is a good thing, 
And uh, I think that that's shifted not just in uh, Buddhism, but also in, in psychology. Uh, generally, in Western psychology, there's more an emphasis on, um, rather than an emphasis on illness and, uh, you know, understanding the causes of illness, but there's more an emphasis on health, like what is actually mental health and how can we understand that and pro promote that and work towards it. And uh, happiness is one of the signs of, of mental health. It's, it's, it's a, a positive thing and it's been shown <coughs> uh, through many kind of experiments and studies that it has all kinds of positive uh, impacts on our, our body and our physiology and our brain development and uh, many different kinds of things. So it's obviously something which is good to develop. Now, uh, when uh, in certain circles in, in meditation, then they, they make a big deal about not being attached to happiness, right? So you get the happy feeling and immediately you feel guilty for it, right? So first thing comes the happiness, then comes the guilt. I'm attached to it. I'm a bad person. Then the happiness goes away. You think, oh, phew, well, that's good. I'm, just, I'm back to normal. Uh, but that's not really the right way to be thinking about it. And uh, the happiness, you know, by no means is seen, uh, happiness of meditation is by no means seen as being a problem in uh, Buddhism, the way that the Buddha taught it. Uh, and the idea that happiness generally is something which is uh, dangerous or needs to, is something to be um, watched out for is not found at all in the uh, early Buddhist teachings. It's completely absent. What you do find uh, occasionally, maybe in the whole of the, the Pali Canon, maybe two or three or four times, you find mention of uh, somebody who uh, ha has already attained some kind of profound state of meditation and who gets stuck there and doesn't proceed. Yeah? And so the problem there is not that they develop the happiness which allowed them to develop that pro profound state of meditation. The problem was that they won't then be able to step forward beyond that. Okay? So that's mentioned just a very, very few times. But that's not, for most of us, that's not where we're at in our spiritual lives. Yeah? Uh, most of us, we're scrabbling around in much shallower waters and these I issues are not really problems for us. What's the problem for us? Uh, generally, if you, if you look at uh, what everybody says on meditation retreats and what almost everybody says when they come to Buddhism is that my mind feels very scattered. Uh, I keep thinking about this and that. I'm very stressed. You, know, you can feel the stress in your body. You can feel the stress in your mind. And how can I uh, find some way out of that? Okay, so the way out of that stress is through the happiness. Yeah? That's the way of solving that immediate problem. What's the, what's the actual problem we're dealing with? What's the actual problem? Not some kind of theoretical idea that uh, you can get attached to refined states of, of bliss in, in high states of concentration or something, but what's the actual problem we're dealing with? And that actual problem is the stress, the worry, the disturbance, the, the sheer uh, volume of stimulus which we receive in our modern world. And this is something which we really need to deal with. And there was a, a very um, wise statement made on that by um, uh, a German scholar. And he commented that with the, uh, uh, that in the past in ancient India, that the uh, sages and the, the rishis were able to practice and uh, realize profound states of peace in their meditation. But that these states of mind are very difficult for us to achieve with the fast pace of modern life, uh, with rapid communications and with a stressful lifestyle. And that statement was made by the German professor Max Müller in about 1880. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have a lot of things then. Yeah. So let's all put it into perspective. So if we find uh, meditation is difficult and all of those things, then don't get hassled about it. It's entirely normal. <coughs> That's what to expect. So, but we shouldn't despair. When we come to Buddhism, what is the experience? What's the experience that drives us here? What's the experience? Why, why, is, uh, why are all you people here in this room? Yeah? What's, what's actually the purpose? And the, the, uh, if we look into ourselves and ask, us that, ask ourselves that question, ultimately what that comes down to is suffering, dukkha, 
we're here because we suffer. If we weren't suffering, if our lives were completely perfectly happy and satisfied and content in every way, then we wouldn't be here. We'd be out enjoying ourselves somewhere. Yeah? Uh, but the reality is that all of us suffer in some way and have suffered. We've felt sadness, we've felt grief, we felt stress, we felt uncertainty. As the, the, we feel the, the sufferings of the body and sickness, we have immediate sufferings of tension and stress from work and relationships and so on. We have more sort of deep level underlying existential suffering, you know, fear of death, yeah, fear of meaninglessness in life. So it's all kind of suffering happening on different kind of complex levels. And uh, any, any one of these or any combination of these uh, awakens in us some kind of need. When we have a suffering, we, we, we somehow we, we have a need or a wish to deal with that, to get out of it. We don't, uh, suffering, that's what suffering means, is a sense of, of dis-ease, of dissatisfaction. And so we, 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 try, we want to respond to that in two ways. And the Buddha said that there's two ways to respond to suffering, and one is through despair, and one is through a search. Yeah? So either despair or a search, when you're afflicted by suffering. Yeah? Either you, you just go downwards and downwards and downwards into depression, you don't, can't see your way out, or else you start looking. What is there? Asking a question. What is there? Where is there someone who is saying something, even one word, that can uh, uh, help me, that can address this problem? And of course, uh, this is where uh, Buddhism comes in. And the first noble truth that Buddha talked about was the truth of suffering. And so sometimes it's, it's said or uh, appreciated or, or uh, criticized sorry, in Buddhism that you know, Buddhism is negative because it focuses on suffering, but that's not at all my experience. You know, my experience is that there's there's a, there's a, 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 a time of recognition, yeah? and when the Buddha said there, there's suffering is real in the world, he's acknowledging, well, that which you are feeling, yeah, that's the reality of life. So he's pointing to a commonality. He's bringing people in. He's accepting the fact that we are imperfect, that we are flawed, that we suffer. Yeah, we have pain. And when that's accepted, uh, then we can uh, start to think about what we can do to address that. So, when we come to Buddhism, we suffer. And we come to Buddhism and we hear that word, the word dukkha, you know, the word suffering. Then this gives rise to faith. Yeah? It gives rise to faith. Ah, oh, that the teachings that the Buddha spoke of, in fact, do address this problem which I have in my life. And then we, we listen to the kinds of things which the Buddha said were suffering. Yeah? He said, uh, aging is suffering. Yeah? Sickness is suffering. Death is suffering. I just went yesterday, we attended a, a, a funeral. And uh, you know at that 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 funeral. Uh, I always find uh, attending a funeral to be quite a, um, a moving uh, and profound experience. And one of the reasons is because in uh, in the in the Buddha's life story, uh, you know, when it talks about what it was it that spurred the Bodhisattva <coughs> on to spiritual practice, Siddhartha Gautama, when he, before he was. Enlightened, who's living in the palace, who's endowed with all the luxuries and so on. And according to the traditional story, he, the, 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 the gods sent down four, what they call four divine messengers. And the four divine messengers were a, uh, an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a monk. And of course, when you go to a funeral, then all of those things are there. So I always feel it's, I'm very blessed that all of the divine messages are there present in the funeral. You have old people, you have, you know, all the old people come to the funeral, they're all sitting there wondering who's next. <laughs> and, uh, of course, always sick people there. Yeah, you have the dead person uh, contemplate. And then this is why we invite the monks or the nuns to come and perform the funeral ceremony. Yeah? And that's always raising the possibility of an escape, the possibility of there's something we can do about it. There's a practice that we can do. So for me, that, that environment in a, in a funeral is always a very sacred uh, uh, kind of environment for that reason. 
So when the Buddha spoke, uh, he didn't just speak of suffering, uh, but he also spoke of the ending of suffering. And I remember one time when I, I saw a book on the uh, great thoughts of mankind. And I, I said, oh, okay, maybe it's got something from the Buddha in there. So I looked up under Buddha, under the great thoughts of mankind, and had great thoughts of, under the Buddha. It had, there is suffering and there is an origin of suffering. And that's it. Yeah. Two, two noble truths. Not <laughs> and I thought, well, that's they're not necessarily great thoughts. I thought they're fairly mediocre thoughts, actually. And uh, missed out the ending of suffering and the way leading to the ending of suffering. Yeah? And that's where the, the greatness of the Buddha shows not just to recognize uh, our problem, our existential problem, but to also recognize how, what do we do about it. Where are we going? Where is, this, what, where is this path leading? How can we change our life so that we lead to an ending of suffering? And so this is the arising of faith, that uh, there is something that can be done. The Buddha spoke to this problem that I'm having. He spoke to these uh, stresses I'm experiencing in my life. He spoke to the pain of separation and loss. He spoke about uh, the suffering of uh, growing up and the different experiences we have to learn. He spoke about uh, the pain of confusion, uh, the pain of feeling inadequate, uh, the pain of not knowing what to do, all of these kinds of things. And he said, that, well, there's something we can do about all those things. And so when, when the faith arises, you know, faith is an emotional response to the teachings, yeah? And so in Buddhism, there's always these two aspects to teachings. When we listen to a teaching, we should find that the teaching is uh, logical and reasonable. Yeah? And we should find that it's acceptable. We can test it and find whether it's true or not. Yeah? So it has that side. But it also has that emotional side to it, which we describe as being faith. There's, there's, there's a sense of, of emotional resonance and connection with the truth, with, with, the, with the teachings. And that emotional contact with the teachings gives rise to joy. Which I think is quite a, a marvelous thing. This is what I, I, I mentioned uh, before the meditation a little bit earlier this evening. And I said that uh, I, you know, when I used, used to uh, chant the Metta Sutta, and just chanting the words of the Metta Sutta, I found that these feelings of joy would come up quite spontaneously. And... Uh, that that the, the those those feelings that emotional response yeah, is something which comes from like an, from an encounter with the truth of the Dhamma and the truth of Buddhism. So this is quite nice. This is something one of my favorite little teachings that the Buddha said: suffering gives rise to faith, faith gives rise to joy. Yeah. <laughs> so suffering gives rise to joy. Yeah. So always very good to reflect on that. That. That when it, whatever we're going through, whatever suffering that we're experiencing, yeah, that this that this all comes within the first noble truth. It's all part of the path. It's part of the practice. Now that joy, which is given rise to, uh, which uh, we call in Buddhism, the word we use in Buddhism is um, piti. It's a Pali word, piti, not not the English word pity, but the Pali word piti, which we usually translate as rapture. And rapture uh, means basically means a sense of uh, uplift, uh, which we experience in our meditation. Not just in meditation, uh, 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 but uh, can be experienced in um, uh, in anything. You know, it starts out with just the simple experiences of joy and happiness, which we we can have through doing anything good. Okay. So all of that is included. So it means giving a birthday present to somebody and then they feel happy when they get it and you feel happy because you gave them a birthday present. Yeah? Anything like that, any, something as simple as that, something as simple as uh, giving somebody a glass of water and then being, being glad that you've done that or um, helping someone. Anything, any kind of joy or happiness that comes from doing something good. Okay? If you get joy from doing chanting or you get joy from, from listening to the Dhamma talk or whatever. Uh, any kind of wholesome feeling of uh, uh, happiness and joy is comes under that that um, idea of pamoja or, or piti. Pamoja is more the kind of the initial 
stages they call they usually translated as gladness, any kind of gladness that we experience. Now it's important to notice that this this very and this is one of the great things about the Buddhist path is that this is a very, very simple emotion. Right? It's nothing grand, right? nothing spectacular. It's something we all know and we've all experienced. Yeah? And, uh, and yet it's an essential part, a foundational part of the whole spiritual life. Yeah? In a sense of pamoja, a sense of a simple, wholesome gladness or happiness. So when we recognize that, this is important, that we recognize that and that we say, okay, <coughs> let's do it. All right? If pamoja, that sense of gladness, is something the Buddha said to develop as part of the path, what is it that gives rise to pamoja? And for different people, that will be very different. Yeah? And we all know that. We all know that our emotional responses to things varies wildly. Some people get a lot of joy out of service. Yeah? And they'll say, okay, I'm going to go down to my local charity and, and give time every week and I feel it gives me so much joy to be able to help others. Yeah? Some people get joy out of doing devotional activities. They want to go to the temple and join in with the chanting and the pujas and so on. Uh, so people can, many things. Some people get joy from their creative work. Yeah? Uh, it can be anything. But whatever it is that brings you that joy, that pramoja, do it. Yeah? And don't feel uh, um, uh, don't feel guilty. <laughs> don't feel reluctant. Don't feel that, oh, this is just indulgent or I'll just get attached to it or it's not important. It's very important. It's incredibly important because if you can't find the joy in what you're doing and if you can't find the joy in your spiritual life, you're going to stop. Right? You, you, absolutely. You will not continue your spiritual practice by just grinding away at it. Right? It just doesn't happen. You need to find the joy in that that's going to lead you on. And, and that, that can't be based on some kind of theoretical idea of what you should be doing. And if that's what it's based on, then it's not going to work and you're going to give up. And, and this is, for example, when I was um, much younger and I was involved with um, various kinds of uh, activist organizations, including Animal Liberation. And uh, one of the things which they recognized was the thing they call activist burnout. And basically, you, you, you have a two-year period, and then that's it. Right? People give their time for two years as a volunteer, and then that's, that's it, and then they stop. Why, why is that? Well, because they're not getting the joy in it. Yeah? And uh, they're not getting the feedback. And so we, we had to kind of recognize this. It's especially important, something like Animal Lib, because you know, you're always confronted with these pictures of you know, factory-farmed pigs and animals being cut up for experiments and all of these kinds of things. So it's pretty kind of uh, emotionally difficult to handle. So we had to uh, sort of very consciously try to address that by bringing some, some joy and some lightness into it, which is not necessarily the easiest thing in animal lib. But anyway, uh, so it's very, very important to remember. Yeah, You're not, absolutely, you are not going to succeed and you're not going to get very far and it's not going to work if you just push it. Okay, And you can, yeah, you can get through a couple of retreats like that. You can go and sit a 10-day vipassana and sit there and charge your way through, but it's not going to last you very long, all right? You need to find that joy and you need, and that can't be something which is only dependent on some kind of uh, idea of something that's on some distant mountaintop, right? When I get my meditation together and my jhanas together and so on and so forth over there, then I'll have lots of joy and happiness and so, you know, it has to be something you can find right here and now that's very joyful. Yeah? And again, can be many different things, you know? So, you know, uh, for myself, I, I love, I love the, the Buddhist scriptures and uh, this is how my mind works. And so I love to do the study and uh, writing and, uh, and so on of Buddhist scriptures and I find a lot of joy in that. So that's my thing. That's one of my things. I also I love the bush and the forest. I love being in the bush. I love being alone in the forest. Yeah? This is something that's very, very joyful for me. Yeah? And so I find that very nourishing. Uh, so these are these are some of the things that were, and I love. To, I also love um, working and and helping and supporting others in Buddhist practice. Yeah, so I do this as well. 
and there are, there are some other things that I don't like about Buddhist practice and that I found were not joyful, so I, I don't do them. And other people, sometimes they want me to do them and I say, no, I'm not going to do it, <laughs> I don't care. You know, and uh, it depends on your conditioning. When I was at uh, my early years at, in Thailand, one of the things that I didn't like or grew to dislike was, was uh, having a lot of uh, group meetings, like sitting together in a room with people doing meditation all day. And I found it really annoying after a while. And uh, I, used to, I used to come and, and uh, at the beginning of the meditation, I'd come and just bow to the Buddha with the other monks and stuff, and then I'd just take my sitting cloth and I'd just go off into the forest and sit there instead. I just couldn't stand sitting in a room with people all day. I found it just un stressful. So, uh, um, so I stopped. And so when I set up Santi Monastery, uh, we don't do that. That was one of the reasons I enjoyed living with Ajahn Brahm at, in Bodhinyana because uh, the monks there don't do that either. They uh, emphasize on meditating in solitude in your kuti, and that's what I really like. And so when that ha when for me, that means that when we do come together as a group, from time to time, then it, that is a joyous occasion. Yeah? Then we do enjoy the meditation and the chanting and the talk and so on together, but because we're not having to do it all the time. So for me, anyway, that's, that's my, my experience. <clears throat> so you need to find that. Okay? You need to find what it is that nourishes you, that gives you joy, what it is that's ordinary, that's every day. It's not necessarily some kind of exalted spiritual practice or anything like that, but just something that gives you a sense of satisfaction uh, and that you can feel happy to do every day and that you can, you can think to yourself, yeah, I can keep doing this. Yeah? And if I was to do this for the next 20 or 30 years, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah? So this is very important. So this is that sense of pamoja. Now when we have that sense of, general sense of well-being, sense of gladness, <coughs> in our mind, then when we come to meditate, then it's relatively easy. Our minds are prepared, they're like primed. It's easy to develop a sense of um, uh, uh, piety, of rapture. Now, if we can't get uh, happiness, we can't get rapture arising in our mind in meditation, then we should investigate what's the reason for that. Is, it, do I have a, a, uh, is there something wrong with my precepts? Am I not keeping my sila? Am I acting in a way that's harmful to others? Yeah? Do I have some feeling of guilt or remorse because of what I've done? Is that what's stopping me? Have I been um, uh, aggressive or angry towards other people? Have I treated people with disrespect? or something like that? Have I been lazy? Have I not done my duties that I should have done? What is it that's, that's, that's causing this? Uh, and so we should investigate and see why, why it's difficult to arouse happiness in the mind. But if we're engaging ourselves in a healthy way uh, in our lives and trying to develop the happiness in that way, then uh, hopefully we can give rise to this sense of piti, of rapture. Now, <coughs> that rapture is... Uh, most effectively uh, developed through metta meditation is a very good way of doing it, or uh, certain other kinds of meditation which are, um, say, like uh, recollection of the Buddha. If there's someone who has a lot of faith in the Buddha, then recollection of the Buddha can be very good for giving rise to rapture. Uh, so there are certain meditations like that which are helpful for arousing that. Uh, generally speaking, breath meditation is not as effective at giving rise to rapture. Uh, it's more for giving rise to tranquility. But uh, there are lots of things that you can do with breath meditation that can help you to, uh, in, uh, to give rise to rapture and to bliss in that. I won't go into those things now, but that's one of the major um, parts of Ajahn Brahm's teaching on, on breath meditation in particular. So if you want to work with that, if you want to do breath meditation, and if you find that when you're doing it that uh, it doesn't give rise to rapture or happiness, if you feel that breath meditation is dry, that it's not giving you the joy, then I would strongly recommend uh, getting hold of some of Ajahn Brahm's teachings on meditation and uh, trying out some of the ideas which he suggests there. So one of the reasons I don't talk about this too much is because I know that Ajahn Brahm emphasizes it a lot in his meditation uh, teachings. So, uh, now that sense of rapture, the sense of joy, uh, manifests in our body and our mind in various 
ways, okay? Uh, and uh, in terms of a sense of uplift, it feels like an electric shock. It feels like the, the hairs on our skin are standing up. It feels that we feel like a smile on our face or you can feel like a tremble or a shaking or many different manifestations that it has, okay? So when you're meditating, any things like these happen. Uh, don't worry about them, okay? They're just, they're just normal. If they don't happen, also don't worry about them, okay? They're not important. Whether they happen or not happen is not important. The kind of rapture which is important is one which we call pervasive, okay? It's paranapiti. And pervasive rapture, as the word sound, sounds like, uh, is, is it fills your whole body. Okay, it pervades your whole field of experience. Okay, so when we close our eyes, we turn our attention inwards, we have a, uh, an, a, an apprehension of, our, of, of this kind of field of our body, uh, which is, which is um, uh, kind of uh, uh, manifesting inside our mind. Now, as we... Uh, go deeper into our meditation, this image, this self-image that we have becomes more and more clear. And uh, that self-image, that body image, is becomes pervaded with this sense of rapture. So it becomes completely filled with rapture, just like, uh, say, uh, uh, the images that the Buddha uses, are like the image of, like say, cloth or something like that that becomes soaked through with water. So this is why when we're teaching the metta meditation that I'm always talking about putting the, the mind inside the body, of spreading the rapture, the feeling through the body, yeah, of being very grounded in the experience. And this is one of the qualities, the essential qualities uh, of the specifically uh, meditative development of these emotional qualities. Okay? So now we're moving away from an area of like general psychology Okay? When we're moving away from the idea of just having an ordinary, happy, healthy mind, yeah? which, is, which, is, which anybody would, what would understand and would aspire towards, and now we're looking towards something which is much more specific and much more refined, and that is the, the development of our consciousness in meditation. Now, for that development in meditation, we need to have that sense of steadiness and groundedness. Okay? It's not enough just to have a very kind of vague sense of, of happiness or you know, feeling good or whatever, that's nice, that's fine, but that's not going to lead us to deep samadhi. It needs to be more concrete. Okay? It needs to be more grounded, embodied. So we have this idea and we have this, this, this image in our mind of ourself filled with rapture and bliss, like a, a Buddha image Imagine a crystal Buddha image, a crystal Buddha that's filled with light. Yeah. Filled with light and glowing. And so that's this kind of self-image, the image of our body, which we're starting to see here. And of course, when I'm using the word body here, I'm, using, I'm starting to use that in, in, a, um, in an ambiguous way. Actually, the, the light that we're seeing, the rapture that we're seeing, is... Uh, not a physical thing, okay? It'll have physical effects, right? It will be measurable. If you ha if you are wired up to MRI scans and people testing your breathing and your heart rate and your pulse and everything like that would all be changing as this process goes on. No doubt there's physiological effects of it. But what we're concerned about is not the physiological effects. What we're concerned about is the experience inside our mind. And that experience... <coughs> Our self, our body, our own image of who we are as it manifests in the present moment becomes like a, 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 a self filled with light and bliss. Now, as we can develop that, uh, our self becomes a very pleasant place to be. And this is very, very important. So much of the agitation and stress that we experience in life is because we feel this kind of knot inside ourselves. We feel this sense of we don't like us. We feel, we feel this dissatisfaction with who we are. With, we don't, 
We don't respect ourselves, we don't respect our thoughts or our feelings, and we want to, uh, something out there is more interesting. Somebody else's thoughts are more interesting. Somebody, this, this society is better. I mean, we, we're moving outside of ourselves because we, we're not, because, because that, that is more real to us, it's more true than our own thoughts, our own reality. So when we develop this in meditation, we have this immediacy of perception of our own self as being balanced, as being whole, as being integrated, as being joyful. And when we perceive ourselves in that way, we become content, we become tranquil, we become settled. With a depth of tranquility which was previously unknown to us. We, for the first time, we start to realize what peace of mind actually is. We start to realize what serenity actually is. And the mind sinks further and further down into this sense of deep tranquility. And here we start to get into areas which are difficult to describe uh, using our ordinary language. But there's a sense in which this, this kind of tranquility uh, is actually, is, it's like, I remember when, I was, when it was first um, described to me, I couldn't quite understand it because it was, it was said that it was quite stiff. There was a stiffness to it. And I thought, well, surely that can't be right. Surely it must be soft. Well, yeah, it's true. It should be soft. But, but it's also true that there is this kind of stiffness to it, uh, which is, um, it's just one of those paradoxes. It sounds like a paradox, but when you experience it, it's actually very natural. But the mind becomes like so settled that it almost kind of doesn't want to move. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like, it um, becomes like jelly. Instead of being liquid, it's like jelly. It sort of wants to keep itself in that kind of form. It might still wobble around a bit, but it wants to keep itself in, in one form and in one place. It has a resistance to moving. And so at this stage in meditation, you know, you won't be feeling like going anywhere. Yeah? You won't be feeling restlessness. You won't be feeling like, oh, is the meditation up yet? <laughs> Have I done half an hour yet? Have I done an hour? Yeah? And all of those feelings will be gone. Instead, you'll feel like, I could just sit here forever. Okay? Now that feeling will pass, of course, yeah? and pain will come back into your knees or whatever. It's not going to stay there forever. But that feeling starts to arise where no longer are you looking for some experience or something out there, but you become incredibly content to be inside here. And that contentment and that happiness and that bliss is directly due to the feeling, the emotional feeling of happiness which you experienced right from that start. Okay? The experience of dukkha, the rising of faith, the, the, the response to that faith with the sense of happiness, well-being and gladness development of that and rapture in meditation and now the, um, the stillness and the tranquility that comes from that. All of those things are intimately linked and it's based on a very simple fact of psychology which is that the mind sticks to what it likes, basically. That's what the difference between happiness and, 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 and pain is. Pain is an aversive thing. It pushes us away. Yeah? So as long as there's pain in the mind, the mind will move because it's being pushed away. When there's happiness, the mind is sucked in, and it's stuck on there. Happiness is like a glue. Yeah? And so this is why in the images, if you look at the images that the Buddha uses for this happiness, it's always the image of water, yeah? of water soaking through something. It's the image of like a lotus, which is underneath the, the, the water, growing underneath the water and soak through with the water. And that, that, that water is the, the happiness, and the lotus is like a body filled with pleasure. Always is this imagery of, of water is soaking through things. And this is that imagery. The water is always something which is sticking and binding things together. So the happiness sticks the mind together, 
keeps it as one. Yeah? And so when the mind is very uh, happy, incredibly content, doesn't want to go anywhere, doesn't want to move, then uh, the mind will go into what we call samadhi. And uh, samadhi, again, is the direct outcome of development of happiness. And samadhi, of course, in the, the, the proper sense, the technical sense in Buddhism, always refers to what we call the four jhanas. Uh, now, when we, we translate the word samadhi, then we, we, we use the word... Uh, we use the word concentration. Uh, but really, it's best to just keep the Indic word here because it's really referring to something which we don't have a sort of a general or sort of common English word for. So when we're talking about uh, uh, samadhi, we're talking about the attainment of the four jhanas, which is uh, a state of deep unification and oneness of mind. The mind withdraws from the senses withdraws from sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. You can't hear anything. You can't feel anything with the body. You come inwards and become absorbed into the mind and into the meditation object and then rest within that in a state of stillness and bliss for a period of time before the mind comes out again. So this is something which... Uh, simply happens naturally when the mind is developed and the conditions are right. It's not something which can be forced. It's not something which um, you can... Um, you know, you can't really learn a technique for it. All the meditation techniques, really, they do. They kind of manage the, the more or less the preliminary stages of the path. But once you get close to, to developing samadhi or jhanas, really, the meditation techniques can't do all that much for you. So they something which just happens when the mind lets go and goes inside itself. Now, what the Buddha said again and again and again and again about this is that samadhi Samadhi is the immediate condition or the vital condition for um, knowledge and vision of things in accordance with the truth, in accordance with reality. What that means is that when the mind goes into a, a state of samadhi is a depth of, of awareness and a clarity of awareness which... Uh, is the condition or the cause for the arising of deep wisdom and deep insight. Okay? So one has a light of wisdom, a light of mindfulness, which can then see the truth in a very profound way. Okay? And so this is the cause of the, the deep insight into the Four Noble Truths, the deep insights into uh, impermanence, suffering, not self, what the Buddha called the marks of existence. Uh, the the deep insight into dependent origination, deep insights into emptiness, not self, all of these things. These happen as a result of uh, the practice of samadhi. And the Buddha said that this experience of samadhi is something which is close to nibbana. Okay? So somebody who's developed these jhanas and who has the insight which comes from these jhanas is close to Nibbāna, Nibbāna Seva Santike. This is right in the vicinity of Nibbāna. And so at this point in development, at this point in practice, um, there's hardly anything which separates a person from the realization of Nibbāna or realization of the highest truth. Hardly anything, just like a veil, a thin veil of ignorance thin veil of delusion. Now, maybe it'll take a long time to penetrate that veil. Maybe not. Who can say? It's right there, actually. The truth is right there. Nibbāna seva santike. The truth of Nibbāna is right there. It may take a short time. It may take a long time. But eventually you'll see it. 
and of course the, the Buddha described Nibbana as Nibbana Paramang Sukhang. Nibbana is ultimate bliss. And so, of course, as ultimate bliss, Nibbana is an ultimate bliss because it feels happy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one time somebody asked Venerable Sariputra about that. They said, how come Nibbana is blissful if there's nothing, if you don't feel anything? And Sariputra said, it's blissful precisely because you don't feel anything. So at that stage, when the mind becomes very, very subtle and very, very refined, even pleasant feeling is felt as being a bit irritating. Yeah? Pleasant feeling is still, it still causes the mind to move. It's still a something. Yeah? And even neutral feeling, it's still a something. And so the mind always inclining towards more and more peaceful states of mind. But one of the critical things, one of the things which is very often misunderstood, you see, people people try, people worry about nibbana. Yeah, nibbana is annihilation. It's the end of everything. It's the, it's dismal. I don't want to get nibbana. There's going to be I can't enjoy myself if I get nibbana. Blah blah blah. And there's all this kind of, uh, you know, we're like you know over here, and nibbana is kind of over there, and we're kind of worrying about it, or we think we understand it. But the Buddha Buddha didn't any go to any great lengths to to um, sort of describe Nibbāna philosophically, but the, the, key, the crucial thing is that Nibbāna is always presented in a way which is ontologically negative and psychologically positive. And if you remember those two things, then I think we, that, that problem dissolves itself. So when I say it's ontologically negative, what I mean is that uh, when the Buddha uh, talked about Nibbāna as something which exists, he always described it in negative terms. Okay? It is the unborn, it is the unmade, it is the unconditioned, it is the uncreated. Right? So there's this constant negation of any attempt to fix Nibbāna as a really existing thing. Yeah? So in that sense, Nibbāna is described in negative terms. But when Nibbāna is described psychologically, it's always described in positive terms. Nibbāna is the ultimate bliss. Nibbāna is the shelter, the harbour, the refuge, the place of safety. And yeah? Nibbāna is the place of coolness. Yeah? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. The Buddha always using these very kind of um, uh, beautiful, very gentle images to describe Nibbāna as, as like psychologically uh, pulling us in, okay? while at the same time refusing to commit himself to saying Nibbāna is this and it is that. Okay? So it's ontologically negative but psychologically positive. And so as, a, as, a, as an outcome of a positive psychology, then that, that um, uh, way of looking at Nibbāna can be seen as coming from or stemming from that whole course of development which we've started right from the beginning. That when we start our Buddhist practice, we start from a sense of despair or a sense of suffering. And the faith in the Dhamma gives rise to a sense of gladness. And that initial sense of gladness is something which is very ordinary something very everyday. And, but starting from that ordinary everyday sense of gladness, why is that sense of gladness there? Well, that sense of gladness is there because there's a relief from suffering. Because we see an escape from suffering and that in itself causes us to be glad and causes us to be happy. And as our meditation continues, our spiritual development continues, we're able to see through more and more suffering, let go of more and more suffering and to realize more and more gladness and happiness at deeper, more profound levels. And the, the outcome of that, the ultimate, the highest reach of that process is what we call Nibbāna. And so that is the point where we let go of suffering completely and, uh, and the experience can only be described as being ultimate bliss, paramang sukhaṁ. Not because we feel a pleasant feeling, um, but because of the absence of suffering of all sorts. So this is my little talk for you this evening on uh, Nibbāna and positive psychology.